All right, in this video, I want to cover uh, two topics, the racial wealth gap and mutual aid. Um, and actually, these two are pretty closely related because what we, what, you'll, what we find is that in people's networks of mutual aid, the friends you can count on to help you, there is also a gap in wealth. We'll talk about that more as we go on. So mostly this uh, reading, is, or this video is going to be focused on the content of uh, the book, uh, the reading from The Color of Wealth by Louis et al. I think that's how they pronounce their name. Um, and uh, to a lesser extent, we're going to talk about the events in Evicted. And to a still lesser extent, we're going to talk about the um, essay or the, the article, uh, Frugality is Hard to Afford. And mostly there, I just want to summarize the parts that you need to know um, you may have been put off by the intense math in the second part of that, and that was not um, mine. I, I, you don't need to know that. You just need to understand the basic causal hypothesis and their evidence for it. So we'll get into that. But in the meantime, um, what's going to frame all of this is the, this idea of a racial wealth gap. So uh, I want to start by just defining some terms you might just you may think of income and wealth as the same. Oh, those are both terms for money, but um, income is different than wealth. Income is the amount of new money you have coming in during a period of time, like a single year. So uh, if you make thirty five thousand dollars a year, which I think is close to the current median income, that is how much new money came into your house household that year. Wealth is the amount of financial assets you have accumulated over your whole life, right? Um, so it's not just what came in a single year, it's what you have in the bank, it's what you have. Uh, for most Americans who have wealth, the main source of their wealth is owning a home, right? Um, that's not income, that's something you already have or have some of and the bank has some of. So I want to emphasize three basic facts here. Um, and then the, this is the background for the whole presentation. There is an income gap between black and white Americans that's pretty large. Um, there's a wealth gap between black and white Americans that is absolutely enormous. And furthermore, even if white people lack wealth themselves, they tend to have it in their mutual aid networks, that is, the people that they can count on to help them. Um, white people tend to be fewer people removed from money than black people. And the last point I want to emphasize, and this was one of the exercises, is just that it takes money to make money. Um, so, and this, the, this is a factor in the reading about frugal, entitled Frugality is Hard to Afford, but it's also one of the underlying uh, premises and the argument given by the color of wealth. Well, let's just start. Um, by uh, looking at this first claim, the, diff the, the difference between the income gap and the wealth gap. So here are a couple charts from your reading. Uh, there, the information here is a little bit old, but um, the gaps have uh, only widened since this time, right? So um, you can see that white people um, from the upper left-hand diagram, make more poor per year on average than black people. And uh, that is, uh, that's a per capita, so that's an average. Um, but and, and not even twice as much, right? So it's a gap, but it's, it, it, it's not, uh, it, it's, and it's significant, and it would be significant all on its own. But if that's then completely dwarfed by the gap in the lower right diagram, which is the uh, net worth, all of your assets minus all of your debts. Um, on average, uh, white people, white households, have several times more wealth than black households, and that gap has been increasing. Um, 
So this is a fundamental piece of economic reality that we really cannot ignore in talking about um, justice in America. Okay, so there's a, a gap uh, in the amount of wealth people have. I want to tie this over to mutual aid networks. Um, kin networks and disposable ties are the two um, things that well, the reading from Desmond talks about. So the color of wealth doesn't count uh, wealth and kinship networks. It, it's just looking at household wealth. But Desmond does talk about mutual aid networks. Um, and furthermore, there was an exercise that talked about mutual aid networks. Um, and there I just asked you um, to think about, for instance, what kind of ties you rely on just to get through um, through the week or the month or the year, um, and whether these are what uh, uh, Desmond refers to as disposable ties. So this is, this is in chapter 12, I think. What he says is, especially in the inner city, strangers brush up against each other constantly on the street, at job centers, and welfare buildings, and found ways to ask for, help, ask for and offer help. Before she met Arlene, Crystal stayed a month with a woman she had met on a bus. And so this, this happens actually because um, Crystal uh, allows Arlene and her family to stay on in the apartment even after they've been evicted, right? So that, um, uh, again, you get these what, what, um, uh, what Desmond calls disposable ties people that you meet casually um, and then actually wind up relying on for aid, for help, mutual aid, helping each other. Um, and this is actually something that I think people do have experience with in college, if only because you meet people uh, back in the days when we had classes, physical classes, you would meet people in your classes and form study groups. And that might be an example of uh, what Desmond calls a disposable tie. Um, it's a sort of mutual aid agreement um, coming from a casual relationship. Um, so in the 60s and 70s, Desmond says, poor families could rely on kin networks, that is, biological family, to keep afloat. But large-scale social transformations, the crack epidemic, the rise of the black middle class, um, and that it, which also meant that um, middle class African Americans were leaving ghetto neighborhoods and moving to the suburbs, um, and the prison boom among them. Um, so, middle class African Americans were able to move to the suburbs, and by and large, the poorer African Americans get caught up in the uh, school to prison pipeline. Right, so the prison boom is a factor here. Well, what this means is that the family safety net has been um, uh, frayed in poor communities, and people have to rely more on disposable ties. And actually, I should say here that um, for the for a lot of these, um, Desmond is just talking about uh, poor people in general, but they all tend to hit poor African-Americans harder. Another thing that he points out rather oddly is that um, welfare programs actually disincentivize kin dependence. That is, if you are getting money from your family, you're less able to get welfare. Um, and so this is, this is, this is a, what they call in, in economics a perverse incentive. You want stronger families. Um, the government has an interest in stronger families. It makes for a more stable society. And yet we are punishing people who have strong family ties. So that, that just seems perverse. Um, and it all arises out of this desire um, amongst peop uh, uh, people who administer, well, this, this desire that a lot of people have that we need to be absolutely sure that the recipients of public welfare um, deserve the money, right? And there's this massive fear of uh, actually giving basic necessities to someone who doesn't deserve them. 
And so we worry that, you know, someone who might have money in their family um, uh, would be getting, would be supposedly wrongly getting welfare. Okay. In any case, kin networks and disposable ties. What we see in the book is that people are relying on different casual, different networks to stay afloat, either family or casual networks. And one of the things we'll see as we go on is that actually folks in the trailer park are fewer degrees removed from people who can genuinely help them out financially. All right, so now let's go to the color of wealth. Color of wealth says two things. One, we need to focus on the wealth gap and not the income gap. People always, when they talk about the economy, they talk about incomes, but really we should be talking about wealth. And secondly, we need to focus specifically on the racial wealth gap. Um, so economic inequality is important. Economic inequality is most is best measured through inequality in wealth. And of the forms of economic inequality out there, um, the racial wealth gap is most important. So this is uh, part of their argument uh, for um, focusing on the wealth gap. Income can change on a dime, but wealth changes over generations. Our lives are shaped by the wealth or lack of wealth of our parents, our grandparents, and our ancestors. An estimated 80% of assets come from transfers from prior generations. Most people who have wealth inherited wealth. Earned wealth is only 20% of wealth. And what this means is that the history of financial situations of prior generations are the primary cause of the racial wealth gap. So when you move from talking about income to talking about wealth, you move from talking about the present to talking about history, because it is history that has shaped the wealth, wealth inequality. Until our policy tackles disparities in wealth, and not just income, until it recognizes and compensates for its own responsibility in the racial wealth gap, the United States will never have racial or economic justice. Um, there is ultimately, though, a central causal argument for saying that we need to worry about wealth rather than income. Wealth allows people to weather hard times wealth allows people to invest and profit in good times. In a situation like now where uh, the COVID downturn is hitting people hard, it's hitting people harder if they don't have um, savings to fall back on. And again, 80% of those savings is going to come in uh, by 80% of the savings in America is, is inherited wealth. Um, also, if, when good times come back around, uh, you want to be able to profit. You want to be able to start a business or grow a business. That requires wealth. All this leads to what I've marked on this chart here as intermediate conclusion one. I see one. This is a, this is a statement that follows logic, uh, argumentatively uh, from the two statements before it. Uh, the wealth gap drives the income gap. Right. So if we just focus on income, we are looking at an effect. We want, if we focus on wealth, we look at a cause. And since we want to look at causes, that leads to our final conclusion. We should focus on wealth and not income. So all this, I, the idea that the wealth gap drives the income gap gets back to um, this old saying that I put in one of the exercises. It takes money to make money. That's That, that was in essentially P2 in the prior argument. If you want to make money, you have to have money to invest. Um, so uh, in the exercise, I ask you to 
um, try and think of cases uh, where this is true. Um, uh, right now, I've just been talking about like ideas like money to start a business. But it also applies to really basic things. And the, the example that I give you in the exercise is transportation. Um, if you want to make money, you need to get a job. If you want a job, you have to have money already for transportation, either to buy a car or to pay for public transportation. It takes money to make money. And in a society where there is some inequality of wealth, what are you going to see? You're going to see that inequality grow over time because the people who have a little bit more have what it takes to make more. Um, this also relates back to uh, a reading which I haven't been talking about in the videos, but is, is one of my favorite readings in this whole class. Um, James Baldwin's Fifth Avenue Uptown, which I had you read before test one. Um, and there's a famous quote here. Anyone who has ever struggled with poverty knows how extremely expensive it is to be poor. And if one is a member of a captive population, economically speaking, one's feet have been placed in, on a treadmill forever. It's expensive to be poor. It's cheaper to be rich. It's a paradox, but it's true. Um, and that's actually the subject of the other reading we had for this week, Frugality is Hard to Afford. Um, so you get once you get into the back of this, there's a lot of math, um, which is designed to sh show a causal hypothesis. I'm going to simplify everything now. And one way to simplify it right away is to just look at the abstract. Um, in any scientific article, the abstract good summary if you need to uh, just read something. So, um, households commonly utilize strategies to provide long-term savings on everyday purchases in exchange for an increase in their short-term expenditures. What? That's actually it's just buying in bulk. This this whole thing is about buying in bulk. In fact, it's very specifically about bulk toilet paper. Um, a popular write-up of this, which maybe I should have assigned rather than the, than the primary source, uh, is from The Atlantic, and it's just called The Privilege uh, of Buying 36 Rolls of Toilet Paper at Once. The point is that actually buying 36 rolls of toilet paper at once. Oh, you think I'm being frugal. I'm, I'm, being, I'm being financially smart. But being financially smart is a privilege. It costs money. Why is that? Well, because you need to have, as we'll see, money saved up. So what they do is they use consumer panel data sets uh, from Nielsen, um, and they determine, well, this is the easiest way to put it. I'll just go to the next slide. Poor people are more likely to buy toilet paper in bulk at the beginning of the month when they have cash rather than at the end. This is because... Um, Buying in bulk is expensive. You, you are making a short-term expense for a long-term benefit. And sometimes people will uh, say, oh, well, you know, poor people just don't have good finance, don't do good financial planning. Um, uh, if they could just save, they wouldn't be poor. And the point here is that in order to save, you have to have money to begin with. And so good financial planning requires you that you already have some assets. It takes money to make money. So it's kind of funny that they're using toilet paper as an example here, but it's actually a really good measure. This is another thing they emphasize. Toilet paper. It's non-perishable. There are no close substitutes. Consumption is unlikely to change structurally within a household. What does that mean? Look, you're always going to need the same amount of toilet paper. Um, pretty much. Um, it doesn't perish so that you can store it. You can buy it in bulk if you need to. And um, it's actually easy to track with consumer data, right? So now they get into a bunch of math, and I just want to present this instead as um, uh, in a simplified for portion, simpl um, simplified fashion uh, using the ideas from Gire. 
So what they are doing here is they are establishing a correlation and then further making a jump. Um, and this is a difficult jump to make, but they do it explicitly from correlation to causation. Right? So what is the correlation? A correlation is a relationship between two variables. Remember, a correlation is a relationship between two variables. So um, the two variables here are just buying in bulk in the time of the month. So the buying in bulk can be yes or no. I, they draw a line. It's like 30 rolls of toilet paper at the same time. Time of the month, early versus late. And what you find is that one of these proportions is different than the other. So you get this kind of, um, when, you, when you do the box diagram, the boxes all, aren't all the same size. Um, the, the, the box for buying in bulk early in the month is larger. There's a correlation. And then what they do is they uh, are able to screen out other causes and make that jump from correlation to causation. And that's always what you have to do. You have to say, well, um, if these two things are correlated, is it possible that there is a third thing that is driving that correlation? So a standard example here is um, the difference between uh, the correlation between smoking and lung cancer and ashtrays and lung cancer, right? Uh, being around ashtrays correlates strongly with lung cancer, especially back in the days when everyone smoked inside. Um, nevertheless, ashtrays don't cause lung cancer. Smoking causes lung cancer. Smoking is a, the third cause that drives both, uh, that drives the correlation between ashtrays and lung cancer. So whenever you see a correlation, two things being related, like being near ashtrays and lung cancer, you need to see if there's some third thing out there that's driving it. And what they are able to do in this article is say, no, there isn't a third thing. In fact, people actually have good financial sense and they will buy in bulk when they're able to, right? So in fact, the, the, the fact that it is early in the month causes, doesn't just correlate, but causes bulk purchases. All right. So this business about buying toilet paper in bulk is just one example of how it is, on the one hand, as James Baldwin said, very expensive to be poor. Actually, I'm going to dive, dive deeper into that because this is all the kinds of examples Baldwin gives. If you're in, it, it, it's in this pay, in, in the frugality paper as well, right? Poor people are more likely to buy uh, from convenience stores. They're more likely to buy at the last minute. This is for all sorts of necessities. And it's not because people want to, it's because they have to. Because as James Baldwin says, it is terribly expensive to be poor. So the wealth gap drives the income gap. And that's half of the claim from the book, The Color of Wealth. The other half is that we need to focus on the racial wealth gap. Um, and they've got a lot of examples here. A lot of the reading is spent discussing ways in which the wealth gap that we see was created by racially discriminatory policies over hundreds of years. But I'm just going to pull one article, one argument here, and you can use this from the article and then make put it in canonical form, standard form for arguments. So we've got two becauses and a therefore. These are indicator words for an argument. Because this challenging economy presents barrier, more barriers for people of color than white people, and because past efforts to raise the floor have left out most people of color, right? So back in um, the New Deal, uh, in the GI Bill, all sorts of public um, government efforts to deal with poverty typically excluded black people and other people of color. So therefore, 
The goal of economic security for everyone will not be reached unless we intentionally tackle racism, right? So P1, um, if the economy is a bad economy, causes more problems for people of color than white people. Premise two, past efforts to deal with economic problems have left out people of color. Conclusion, the goal of economic security um, can only be attained by tackling the racial wealth gap. So then they, the next paragraph backs up and it gives some more reasons for P1. In what ways do people of color place more, uh, face more economic barriers than white people? Both outright discrimination and the costs of segregation block the advancement of people of color. And this is, this is why, it's, why it's key that we're looking at the wealth gap. A wealth gap is an intergenerational thing. If you talk about an income gap, you're just looking at the here and now. But let's face it, um, the past isn't dead. As Steinbeck said, it's not even past. Except that wasn't Steinbeck. That was Faulkner. In any case, the past isn't dead. It isn't even past. Um, the history of segregation and denying wealth to black people has intergenerational effects, right? Um, and so the racial wealth gap winds up being um, something that we have to take on centrally if we're going to understand poverty in America. Um, so to wrap things up, I want to I want to take this back and talk about um, the uh, uh, opening claim in Matthew Desmond's book, which is that we have underestimated the role of housing in the creation and sustaining of poverty. Housing is our is the primary form of wealth in America. If people have income, have something saved up of value, it's typically a home that they own. Um, so if we're going to understand poverty, we need to understand housing, we need to understand the racial wealth gap.